Morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I desire you to be finding the book of 2 Peter. This morning's, uh, what we're going to look at uh, here this day is going to go right along with uh, Sunday school lesson. Uh, if you're here for that, uh, we're going to continue building on that. Uh, probably go back and reference a few things therein. But uh, probably initially read several verses, uh, but come back and really just look at a few. And uh, I don't really think it's been that long since we've been in these this area, these verses, these chapters. Um, but uh, either way, that's where I feel God would have us to be this morning. And we're just going to look at a few words and the descriptions that are therein. And uh, this particular passage uh, was so, I want to say, artistically written. Because they uh, give such detail in the details. It was a, if you would allow me to look at this like a, uh, a, a sculpture. It wasn't just a, you know, a rock in the shape of whatever. You know, if, if, if this passage were a sculpture of a fish, there were individual scales etched into it. It is so descriptive, so much details are in it. And as we read it, uh, uh, oftentimes, um, really up until I sat and, and reread this uh, for like the fourth time last night, I didn't catch all these words that were there. I've always read these words. But they would just, they was leaping off the pages at me as I read this, and uh, just you know, you guys all know I got four kids, right? They're they're the they're the heathens that are in here, and usually the loud ones. Now, Jaylee, the oldest, she can't tell a story. Can't. Like, if she's telling a story, you get bored with it. By the time she gets done, you forgot how it even started, and you forgot what it's even about. You're sitting here like, what? Jace has a little bit of that. He can get through it, but he can go through it so fast that he gets done, and you still have no idea what he's even talking about. Jet and Jameson are the most imaginative. Jet is able to tell a story and convey that and he's able to go slow enough that it's like he's teaching you as he goes. Um, he, he, he puts a lot of effort into explaining the story. Jameson, on the other hand, is probably the best of the four storytellers. And he can tell some outlandish stories. They are vivid with detail. And that's the thing. As he's telling the stories, on the way home yesterday, he was telling us stories about his friend that we don't know who he is. He told us where he lives. He told us all the toys he has, the games they would play, and the things that he would do. And he would not miss any of the details. And you could have him to go back and retell it. And he could tell it with the same amount of details. But he can put the things in there that it's not just a jumbled up mess. You can see every aspect of the story. This passage is so artistically written that you can see every aspect and every detail that God desires us to get from this. And it's excellently written. There's not that there's a bunch of filler words. It's that there is unique words that better describe what it is. Second Peter chapter number two. Maybe I'll be able to breathe and get through this. If not, you guys will just have to stop and listen to me cough for a minute. 
2 Peter chapter 2, going to read the entirety of that chapter. 2 Peter 2, 1, the Bible says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption." and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to right in the daytime. Spots, are, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of, a, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of, Je through the, knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you again here this morning, God, again, we're thankful, Father, just to be in your house. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the words of warning. God, we're thankful, Father, for the instructions, God, that you've given us. And Lord, just the simplicity of your word and the uh, artistic writing that is there, Father, that allows us to see a clear picture, Father, uh, of, of, of the world, of ourselves, of, Father, whatever it is, Lord, that uh, uh, you were going to speak unto us this day. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you can take the guesswork out of it, Lord, because your word is able, it is a living, uh, it is a living thing, God, that is able to speak into our hearts, Lord, that is able to give us direction, Father, that is able to give us a clear, uh, a clear path to travel, Father. It's just, Father, it's able to, to illuminate all the things that are around us, Lord, that are right and wrong. Father, we're just thankful, Father, for all those things that are therein. God, we ask you, Lord, that you speak unto us this day, Lord, that 
you speak into our hearts, Lord, that you uh, that you just shape and mold us, Lord, that you point us in the way, God, that you would have us to go, Father, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, take us in your hands, Lord, and hold us and protect us, Father, Lord, just to lead God and direct our lives, Father, we're just praying, Lord, that here this day, Lord, that each and every heart that is represented and in your house here this day, Father, Lord, that they would look to you long before they would look to themselves, that they would look to you before they look to someone else, Lord, and that they would look to you for all uh, efforts of guidance, Lord, and things, God, that we desire in our lives. Father, we know, Lord, that you are everything unto us. Father, we know that you're the great physician, Lord, that you are the door, you are the way, Lord, of uh, you are the bread, you are, Lord, everything that you have said we are, Father, we Lord, hear this day, God, that you would speak that into our hearts, Lord, that you could help us to take you for exactly who you say you are within your word. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask all these things in your son Christ Jesus' name. And amen. It's a lot that we read. Really is, and it's a lot that we looked at, and you know, look coming back through and uh, uh, looking at, at what we had in Sunday school this morning, and uh, uh, the things that Saul did and the things that Saul didn't do it was simply about God's commandments. It was about waiting on the Lord, and it was about doing what God had instructed. You know, God had instructed, "Hey, you're going to go here, and you're going to sit, and you're going to wait, and then Samuel's going to come." And uh, I, I don't really, I, I can't say that Saul was sitting and looking on his watch and knowing exactly the amount of days and the time and the minutes that was left? I don't know. But I know as an individual, I know as a person, I know as a child of God, and I know as one who struggles with sin, I know what it's like to become weary of waiting. I know what it's like to be thinking, well, you know, God, you've said this, but, you know, I, I, I can see that, that this is here, so we'll just go ahead and take it. We'll go ahead and jump it. We'll just go in. Lord, I don't, you, you, don't, you won't have to worry about me this day. I will just take forth the effort, and I will, I, I, I will do this thinking that we're going to do God a favor. Whether it's through innocence or not, We've seen pictures of that in our Sunday school lesson, and we're going to look at clear pictures of this within uh, what we found here in 2 Peter this morning. It starts off with saying that, hey, there's, there's been false teachers. And then it follows that up and says there's going to be false teachers. We understand that in Jesus' words in the Gospels that there are wolves that are among the sheep. We understand that there are wolves in sheep's clothing. If you have ever watched Looney Tunes, you have seen clear pictures of that, of the, uh, of the uh, wily coyote who, who, who is all the time trying to get the sheep, right? And Sam is that, he, he is that one dog with the red uh, hair covering his face. And I think Charlie was the one with the black hair covering his face. And they would swap shifts. And, and, and lo and behold, there's wily coyote. And he's still over there and he's still trying to get the sheep. Amen. If you have watched cartoons, you can understand what the Word of God is trying to tell you. Part of what I'm going to ask you this morning is, which one are you? Of the characters in the Looney Tune, are you one of the sheep? Are you Sam or Charlie? Or are you Wiley? There is a big difference in who the role that we play. And I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes it's really hard to see them. Sometimes it's hard to know which one we are because at any given time, any different uh, circumstance, things that we endure, things that we go through, our, our roles can change. And it's going to change based upon your faith. It's going to change based upon my faith. Because if I am facing challenging uh, things and in certain times and my faith is really low, in those moments I'm going to be a false teacher. Because I'm not going to be able to stand and proclaim the, uh, all the, the, the truth and the goodness and the greatness of God. I can say it with my mouth all I want to, but my actions are going to say, this guy's a liar. This guy's a fraud. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Verse number two. There's a big word in there. What is it? Starts with a P. 
Pernicious. Very good. Thank you for following along. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. What does that mean? Can be destructive. When you want to put that whole word and lay that word out in its most direct meaning, it is destructive, but the word means gradually destructive, subtly destructive. Meaning that it's not going to be easy for us to see that, hey, I am becoming a false teacher. Or I am, or that person is, or they could be. Okay? Understand that if it is so subtle and so gradual, and how the Bible says that they will probably be bringing in their damnable heresies, if somebody walks in the back door and says, we're no longer going to worship Jesus, that ought to be a flashing red sign to you. Amen? And you would know, hey, that ain't right. But man, if it was just little here and a little there and a piece of this and a piece of that and a little bit of this over here and little by little they could introduce those things but it says this that many shall follow their gradually destructive ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of so now what is the Bible telling us? That when we gradually, little by little, go back and reverting from what we turned away from, from what we repented to, that gradually, little by little, the old man begins to show itself back through, then it says the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And what that begins to speak to us is that our witness, our character, our testimony, and all the things that are important and valuable to the Lord God Almighty... It's destroying it. Because little by little, gradually, destruction is coming in. Verse number 3, there's another nice word that is in there. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words. What does that mean? Deceptive, false, pretend. Many of us have friends that were enticed with feigned words to make us feel like we were friends, to make us feel like they was close to us, to make us feel like this, to make us feel like that. And what they wind up doing is they wind up using you. They wind up using you, they wind up using me, they wind up, uh, we became a pawn in their greater scheme to get one step closer, to get one step above. You know, in our minds we can relate to this by way of work, we can relate to this by way of, uh, you know, people trying to get ahead, get promotions, this, that, and the other, and uh, hey, they, uh, uh, you, you, you might be the boss's daughter, you might be the boss's son, you might be the boss's brother, you could be the boss's wife or husband, and they think if they get close with you, it's going to benefit them, they're going to be able to they climb right up that ladder, and by feigned words, that's what they done, is they made merchandise of you, meaning as you was simply something to sell, or to buy, or to trade. But you was never anything of value, other then I guess merchandise has value, right? But if I'm a store owner, my merchandise is only valuable if you want it, right? If I'm selling something that nobody wants, it's of no value. Can we agree with that? So with feigned words, they shall make merchandise of you. Through false and pretend words, And it says, Whose judgment now of long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth. The next several verses paints this picture that we can see close so clearly by an understanding of the Bible that God has a way of dealing with, with, with things of this nature. God has a way of dealing with people like this. It walks us through the flood. It walks us through the angels. It walks us through Sodom and Gomorrah. It walks us through all these things that we can see and things that we know. We're going to come back to verse 9. But right now we're going to look at verse number 10. 
Now, coming through this, I have always read this and had an understanding that this passage was only speaking of like one particular type of individual. Those that you could say were, you know, going to come in to, to literally to seek and destroy what would be around there. You understand the motives of God being to seek and to save. And you look at the, the motives of the devil being to seek and destroy. And I always had it envisioned in my mind that that is exactly what it was talking about. But now we're talking about, we're, we're beginning to itemize different types of, of people and different characteristics of people. And we can see that even though some some people have all these characteristics that there may be portions of this, these spots begin to shine through. But now it says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Right? Now, we understand that children of God, that we walk by faith and not by sight. Right? That we walk in the footsteps of God. We walk in, uh, the Bible talks us to let us uh, walk worthy of the vocation which we call. When you want to talk about the word walk, this active verb that is in there that is a, a, a moving sense, we can find so much in the Christian life that revolves around the word walk. Now you're either walking with Christ or you're walking away from Christ. But either way, you are walking. We envision in our mind that we have simply sat down and got still. Right? Because we don't want to say to ourselves, I'm walking away from God. Anybody here want to say that? Nobody raise your hand because you don't want to say that. But in your mind, you might say, I'm taking a break. Right? It's okay to take a break, ain't it? It's all right to take a break. It's okay to take a rest. It's okay to, uh, uh, you've got tired. But if you're not moving with God, you're moving away from God. Understand that. There, there is no other way to look at that. You're not able to just sit down and say, well, God, I'm tired. I'll catch up. Because if you're catching up, then that means he's further away. Amen? Can we agree with that? Understand the words that are used, the meaning of the words that are used to give us the picture. Now, chiefly them, now we're not talking about he and we're not talking about a certain person, but we're talking about they, you know, a, a group of people, they that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. We're not talking about anybody. We're not talking about Democrats. We're not talking about Republicans. We're not talking about a, a dictatorship. We're not talking about a monarchy. We're not talking about a, a democratic system. We're not talking about any type of government that you can think. This word government that you find right there, when we see the word government, we want to think of Uncle Sam, you want to think of taxes, and you want to think of this, that, and the other. But this is simply, this word in this context simply means a set of rules. Those that hate rules. Those that hate guidelines. Those that hate... Any other words you want to use for that? That's similar. Them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Why would people hate government? Why would people hate rules? Does church have rules? Tell me some. Tell me some rules that churches have. Well, come on, you guys are lifetime Christians. Come on, tell me rules that churches have. It's really important for you to know them. Come on, rules, let's go, let's have them. What are they? I was hoping somebody would reference that. And it wasn't too long ago I gave you guys little bitty cards that had this on it. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into a covenant with one another, one another as 
one body in Christ. So is there rules in the first paragraph? Right. There's rules that, you know, in most cases, uh, part of being a church is being an active member in a church. Part of being an active member in a church is being a born-again believer. Part of being a born-again believer is following through with believer's baptism. Part of doing all those things is entering into the local body of Christ and cooperatively working to accomplish the will of God. Amen? That's what that first paragraph says. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together. There's that word walk. We engage to walk together. What does the word together mean? United. We engage to walk together in Christian love. What kind of love? Christian love. Earthly love, fleshly love, lustful love. No, it says Christian love. What is Christian love? Let's define that real quick. That is preferring one another. That is letting each and one of us esteeming the other person more highly than ourselves. That is is weeping with someone. That's mourning with someone. That's laughing with someone. That's bearing one another's burdens. Let us walk together in Christian love to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort. To promote its prosperity. The word it's right here. Is this to promote our prosperity? It's to promote the church's prosperity and spirituality. To sustain its worship, its ordinances, its discipline. Now if there's discipline, that means there's rules. Amen? To promote its discipline and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. Is there rules in the second paragraph? Now, when you get into some of the, what are some of those rules? You can get into a lot more of them in the next three, and I'm not going to take the time to say it and keep uh, uh, reading that, but if you want to get into this right here. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our our, uh, deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale of and the use of destructive drugs, intoxicating drinks as beverages, shun pornography, to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. In reading that, if I haven't hit you yet, you may have a pride problem. I've hit myself at least six times in that. Why do we hate government? Why does people hate government? Why does people hate rules? People don't like to be told what to do. Amen? Let's get back on topic of where we're at. Let's, let's, let's turn back to the Word of God here real quick. To them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Some people hate rules. Some people hate the fact, well, if I want to do this, I don't know why I have to bring it before this committee. Or if I want to do this, I don't know why we have to do it that way. I don't know why this has to be done. I don't know why we have to do it like this. Well, mainly because the Word of God says that that, that church should be done orderly. Does it not say that we should operate orderly in a church? And if we hate order, there's a good chance that we hate rules. And if we hate rules, we hate government. And those that feel that way, that want to bypass everything, we then become exactly who the Bible is talking about. Well, I don't like that, and I don't know why we have to do it that way. Because it's orderly. I mean, you don't have to drive the speed limit either. But if you don't, you're probably going to get a ticket. Eventually. It may not be today. It may not be this decade. But eventually, if you speed everywhere you're going, you're eventually going to get a ticket. If you keep living without rules and without government, eventually you're going to get in trouble. It may not happen today. But it's going to happen. Presumptuous. That's a big word right there too, ain't it? And that's very descriptive. 
presumptuous is failing to observe and to obey limits and limitations. Always wanting to push the boundaries. You know any boundary pushers? Those that want to, we just want to push. Now, I told you I have a really good storyteller. That same good storyteller is always the one who's really wanting to push the limitations of my patience and my boundaries. And he will put, a, it's like, he said, oh, here's daddy's last nerve. Let's jump on it. Oh, let's swing on it now. He wants to push that as far as he can go. Presumptuous are they. Always wanting to push. Well, we've, we've, we've bulldozed our way right by this rule. Let's see if we can bypass this one. We've safely navigated two. Now let's push our way past three. Let's go for four. Unable to see the boundaries and the limitations that are there. We read this as false teachers. Those that would be, well, when you read the, 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 the headings and the captions in your Bibles, we look at this as, a, as an individual who is an intentionally desiring to destroy a corporate a, a unity, a unified body in Christ. But that is not at all what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible is clearly, I think, teaching each one of us that we have these qualities. And they're not qualities. We have these characteristics. And it is up to each one of us, what does the Bible say, to die to ourselves daily? Let us each one take up our cross daily and follow after Christ. And that means follow after. That means walk after. That don't mean sit down and take a break. If we are not doing these things, we are these things. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. I want to ask you a question. I don't really want you to answer it out loud. Your facial expression will answer it for me. How many of you have walked out of the back doors of a church house and talked bad about a preacher standing in the pulpit? Why? We don't like their delivery. We don't like that they wear just khaki pants and a fishing shirt. They don't wear a suit and a tie. They might have wore jeans. They don't speak eloquently. They talk too fast. They spit. They sweat so bad that I can't get over the fact that their entire shirt is drenched and that grosses me out. And if you're hung up on those things, you wasn't here to hear the word anyways and this entire passage is about you. Now that hurts and I ain't trying to be mean. I'm just simply being honest with you. Those that don't care to speak evil of dignities. Now when you want to look at the word dignities and you can say, well, hey, well, this is about this, this is about that, these are about all these other things. But we also understand that in the Word of, the, in the word of God that we are to, uh, uh, we, are to uh, uh, we, we should love and we should respect and we should think highly of those that labor and do the work of God. That's Sunday school teachers, song leaders, musicians, deacons. The person who, 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 who uh, uh, counts the money, the person who cleans the windows, as well as the person who delivers the message. We don't care to speak evil of those things, though, do we? Come on, people. I've talked to most of you. I've heard you do it. Don't shake your head this way. Shake it this way. Because we've done it. And we become this. We become all of what we're reading. And what we're reading, we don't like. We don't enjoy that. We don't want to be that. Are we the sheep? Are we the sheepdog? Or are we the wolf? And then this word's natural brute beast. Doesn't even sound pleasant, does it? And it sounds as though that's something that you should be able to see from a mile away.
But you know, there's physical blindness and there's spiritual blindness. And if we're spiritually blind, we wouldn't know so as a natural brute beast anyways. Amen? And if somebody's being a naturally brute beast in such a subtle way, probably wouldn't see it. But read on with me. Made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they don't understand. Why is it that we don't like rules? Because we don't understand their purpose. We don't understand what it is that they do. We don't understand the, 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 their ability to protect every person here. Why is it important for you to be protected? Let me ask you this. How many of you have actually sat and read and understand Oakdale Baptist Church Constitution and Bylaws? Do you understand why the things that are in there that are in there? Why is it important for us to put a, a, a statement of faith in there? Clearly identifying what we believe. That way anybody coming in the back door clearly knows what we believe. Why is it important for us to put what we recognize as marriage in there? Because not everybody views marriage the way the Southern Baptist individuals view that. And I'm going to be honest with you, Southern Baptists don't view it that way no more. Why is it important to have that in there? Because does the Bible not say that marriage is a, a, a lifetime commitment between one man and one woman? It's what the Bible says. So if we believe the Word of God, it's important for us to identify that. And if we don't have government, things to protect us, what if about a month from now you have a woman wants to come in here and preach? Some of you, some of you don't understand why, but it has to do with government, and it has to do with rules, and it has to do with regulations, and it has to do with belief and adherence to the Word of God. Natural brute beast. They speak evil of things that they don't understand. Well, I don't know why that we can't do this, and I don't know why this is here, and I don't know why they can't do that, and I don't know why of this, and I don't know why of that. Instead of fussing about things that we don't know, take an initiative and decide to understand. Now in 13, spots they are and blemishes. I want you to understand the importance of these words. It's, I like this shirt. This is, this is one of my faves. It's thin. I'm sweating like I don't know what right now. But it doesn't really like just sit and hold the water. It kind of, most of it's in my socks. But I like this shirt. Last summer after church one day, we went and got barbecue. We went down the line and we got barbecue. I love barbecue. Barbecue loves all of me. And it likes to cling itself to me. I had spots on this shirt. I had some barbecue spots on my shirt. Did I throw the shirt away? And I cast it aside because there was a spot on it. Shake your head this way, church. I'm wearing the shirt. Come on. Stick with me. I'm literally wearing it. I didn't throw it away. And I didn't cast it aside. What did I do? I washed it. I cleaned it. I put forth the effort to make it right again. Church, that's what we're to do. Just because there are spots or blemishes, you don't kick them out the door. You don't cast them aside. And you don't count them as unworthy. Can you clean them? But who can? God does. Does the Word of God not say that He washed our spots as white as snow? Friend, if you are a born-again believer, 
you have to know one thing that you was a sinner. Amen? So you know you had spots and you know you had blemishes. Spots and blemishes. They can be fixed. They can be clean. And they are still worth just as much to you as the whitest person. As those that are white as snow. Sporting themselves. But now this is where it gets different. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Let me just tell you, there's a lot more people proud to be a sinner than they are Christians proud to be a Christian. I told you the truth. There ain't many people walking around with a pride shirt on that says, I am whosoever. You'll see those shirts, but you're going to see a lot more different kinds than that. Amen? There ain't many people really... I don't agree with you, preacher. I think there's proud Christians all over. All right, well, let's start right here. How many of you told somebody you was proud to be a child of God this week? Show of hands. Nobody going to raise your hand? So now we can understand that there ain't really nobody here proud to be a child of God? Preacher, I like the way you're talking. I'm being honest with you. I want you to see. I want you to see, and not through, I also like John Conley. And let me tell you, church, sometimes we only want to look through our rose-colored glasses. We want to see that it's great. We want to see that things are, uh, it, it, it's wonderful. And I'm not telling you that it's not. Don't hear what I'm not saying, because let me tell you, I can already hear the after-church conversation. Boy, I was listening to the preacher today, and now I know why he's leaving. Somebody's doing this, or somebody's doing that. No, it's about to God's timing. I'm simply being obedient. Has nothing to do with that. But it's all things that we need to know. Amen? It's relevant. Sporting themselves while they feast with you. Let me tell you, some people are proud to come in and destroy a church. That's what they thrive on. I can think of about five people right now that I can draw you a line to every church that they've ever been to and it has crumbled. And I bet you, you can too. But then they have this other word right here that it says, curse children. Ain't that sad? Why does their children become cursed? Because honestly, it's what they grow up knowing. They don't know anything any different. They don't know this and they don't know that. Verse 15, it says they have forsaken the right way and they've gone astray. So if for, who are we talking to now? Let's understand who we're talking to. If you are able to forsake the right way, you have to have first have known the right way. Amen? Are we talking about any lost individual who comes in and wants to take over? Nope. We are talking about born-again believers. We are talking about God's children. This passage is all about the saved, church. It's all about the born-again believers. It is about those who have committed their lives to Christ. Those who have, what does it say? Forsaken the right way and going astray. You know why? Because sometimes rules are offensive. We hate government sometimes because it excludes us. We hate government sometimes because we are affected by the rules because we don't want to change. Eighteen says, When they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. They are trying to make their viewpoint appealing. What if I were to stand here and tell you, I know how these pews would be full and not empty. Christians everywhere would be thinking, okay, tell me more. Tell me more. I know how you'd get people engaged and involved and ready and willing to jump and to do anything. Oh, really? Tell me more. Keep going. Tell me more. Well, first off, that we need to get rid of some of this offensive language. 
some of this is offensive to everybody and it's not all inclusive. So let's, let's get rid of some of this. And then other people won't come in. And you know, we, we're in a really progressive time right now. We, need, we don't need to identify marriage. Let's take that out. And let's make it feel warm and welcome to everyone. You guys want to do that? You want to? Sounds good, don't it? But what are we doing? Little by little, we're taking everything that the Word of God is founded upon and we're going to cast it aside all for what? People? Numbers? Hey, we're getting people in the church. Well, if you ain't preaching the Word, it ain't doing them no good. Hallelujah! While they promise them liberty. You get into Romans, you can get into 1 Corinthians, you get into another part of Paul's writings and you can understand a lot about liberty and liberty simply means freedom. Those who are free are free indeed. The Bible says the truth can set us free. The Bible talks a lot about truth, it talks a lot about freedom and it talks a lot about our Christian liberty. Talks a lot about those things, and while we want to say that, uh, hey, we're we're a child of God and we're being set free, what are you set free from? You are set free from sin. You are not set free just to go about and do whatever. Amen. Nod your head this way. That's what the Bible says. We are free from sin. We are free from our bondage of sin. We have been set free from that. And while we want to set and we want to begin promoting the liberty of Christian freedom and we're free to do this and we're free to do that and we're free to do all these things, we are simply promoting more and more corruption. You ever talk with people in one of the churches? You should. It's good for Christians to communicate. It really is. My students in Monterey, and some of them really they really like to have church conversations with me, and some of them are really open. And their church probably would wish that they wasn't. But Nonetheless, they're really open and they, they, they tell you things. They tell you all what's going on. And the longer they talk, the higher my eyebrows get and the lower my mouth gets. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? Really? You you are doing that? You're doing that? And it's, it's mind-blowing to me. They don't understand it. They don't understand why that's mind-boggling to me. That, well, yeah, well, it's getting people to come in. One I've, I've honestly never understood, and let me tell you, there's not a bigger sports fan in this church house than me, but I've never understood having a Super Bowl party at the church. What well, gets people to come to church on Sunday night? Yeah, but they're not hearing the Word of God, so what good is it doing? Have you ever watched the Super Bowl commercials? There ain't none of them godly. I bet at least they're coming to church. Slowly, subtly, leading towards destruction, using great, swelling, feigned words that are false and pretend and look really good. Promising liberty, but promoting servants of corruption. The Bible says this, For of a, whom a man is overcome, of the same he has brought into bondage. Let me clarify this for you this morning. Church, we are free to do what we want to do. You are 100% free to walk out that back door and live whatever kind of life you want to live. You have freedom of choice. Every choice has a what? It has a consequence. You are free to choose. Your choosing does not make you exempt. Amen? We have Christian liberty. 
just as much as you are free to exit the doors and sin, you are just as free to exit the doors and serve. You're free to choose. The Bible says, For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. The word repent means to turn away from, right? So if I was to repent, this is what it would look like, right? Turning around. This back there. This, that ain't repentance. I've bladed away from it. Where am I looking? Let me give you the visual. Sin, God. Did I repent? What about now? Hurry, because this hurts. Sure didn't, did I? Didn't. As I sat and I studied all this, and I wanted to begin looking at false teachers, I wanted to be able to identify them as Wiley Coyote. I wanted that role and that character to always be identified. But it's not. It's not. And based upon our circumstances, based upon how close we are with God, based upon our knowledge of the Word of God, based upon our assuredness of what we really believe, depends on whether or not we are a false teacher. Even with the most earnest and sincere of intentions, if you step outside of what you are knowledgeable of and you begin trying to help and to mentor and to teach somebody and you're teaching them wrong, you are a false teacher. That's why the Bible says to study to show ourselves as an approved workman. Church, you can't be a teacher of any kind if we're not studying. If you're only going to half-hearted listen to the messages, you're only going to half-hearted read the Sunday school literature, if you're only going to half-hearted look at your Bible during the week, we can't be a teacher. What did Jesus tell us to do in the end of the book of Matthew? We're to go forth into all nations, right? What are we supposed to do? To teach and disciple to teach them about God. Friend, you were told to teach. And whether you like it or not, there's rules that goes along with it. There's government that goes along with it. There are things that we have to do. You get into Paul's writings and studying out the, the different uh, uh, parts of the body of Christ and everything that has a job. And we sit and we think, well, I'm glad I didn't get this one. I'm glad I don't have that one. That goes 100% against the Word of God because the Bible tells you and I to covet the good gifts. Friend, you should want that job. Well, I hope I don't ever get called to do this. I hope I don't get called to do that. False teacher. Now you Wally Cody. Now you're promoting things that ain't true because you shouldn't be hoping that because the Word of God tells you and I to covet the good gifts. That's what it says. To want that. Is it responsibility? Yep. Is it pressure? Yeah. Is it rewarding? You have no idea. Is it worth it? 100%. It's far more rewarding than simply picking the grass. You know, let me be clear and transparent with you. I've always thought that to be best. Many times, especially, especially after reading and really sitting and staring at some of those words and letting them jump off the pages. Many times I find myself being much more the false teacher than I would like to admit. Because a lot of times it's more of, well, this is what the Word of God is. This is what it says. 
and we can have a knowledge of that. Amen? But when it comes back and talking about our subtle ways of our lives and how these subtle things can find a way to shine through and find a way into this and to find a way into that. Church, that's where humility comes in. We have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves before an almighty God. Let us not think ourselves more highly than we should. Stand together with me this morning.